The session today is the last session of our series on spiritual warfare and we're going to look at rebuking the devourer. I want us to conclude with this because I believe that it's one of the most important areas of spiritual warfare and probably that one that is overlooked the most by people. So far, we have examined our part in confronting the devil and his demonic hordes, but there is one form of spiritual warfare where God actually acts on our account. In other words, God does the fighting for us. Previously, we have seen where we are to rebuke the devil, but here we see there is occasion for God doing it for us. Personally, I like that idea, and uh, I have great confidence in God, but not so much confidence in myself, I might add. I don't know how you feel, whether you feel much the same way. All I know is I am fallible. God is infallible. I certainly lack the power and the resources that God has, and because I'm the great sook that I am, I'd like to I like enlisting his help as often as I can. Scripture says uh, this in Malachi chapter three verse eleven, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. In this verse, God says that he, he will rebuke the devourer for us. To me, that is good news. Well, I guess we need to identify just who this devourer is, don't we? So who is the devourer? Most of us would have no problem in acknowledging that the devourer is the devil. But is this consistent with what the Bible is teaching here? I think one of the things that should not escape us is that the devourer is personalized. It's he. In other words, the Lord speaks of the devourer in the uh, sense of being a person. This is important because in most cases this verse will be cross-referenced in your Bibles to Amos chapter 4 and verse 9, which speaks of mildew and locusts that the Lord brings upon Israel cro Israel's crops because of their disobedience. God doesn't rebuke himself. There is a personalization here in the text that we should not miss. The battle is personal and so is the remedy. So who is the person that is devouring? In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Here, the devil is portrayed as a hungry lion on the prowl, seeking his next meal. Could that next meal be you? There is an interesting passage in Genesis where the Lord speaks to Cain about Cain's anger over God's refusal to accept his offering from the fruit of the field. God speaks to Cain the following. In Genesis 4 and verse 7, he says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Whilst this is one of the most difficult verses in the Old Testament to translate, there are some things which we can nonetheless derive from the text. There is a very obvious reference here to Mesopotamian demonology, for instance, which conjures the idea of a malevolent being lurking at the entrance of the door, at the door to devour or threaten an occupant. There is no doubt about the devil wanting to devour people. But according to Malachi, the scripture here, it doesn't stop with people. He devours crops as well as the fruit of the field and consequently produces poverty and hunger. So, what is devoured? The Hebrew text here, the word for devour in Malachi 3 verse 11 means to eat up 
or consume. In other words, it's talking about that which has previously existed as having gone. This is the very activity of Satan. He's come to kill, to steal, and destroy. John 10 verse 10 tells us that. The activity of the devil potentially covers every area of human life. It covers our finances, our physical health, our emotional health, our relationships, our uh, resources, and our employment. There is no area that the devil is content to leave alone. As long as he can bring harm to an individual, he will attack anything, anywhere, as long as we give him an opportunity. What we need to acknowledge, though, is that his methodology is such that the outcome is always destructive. He will devour anything that comes his way, much like the greatly maligned great white shark. Sometimes the devourer just get things, gets things moving and he leaves the rest over to the Lord. Man disobeys God and then he reaps the consequences of his disobedience. The problem is that often it is people that are devoured, just not the things or relationships. As we see in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. In verse 1 it says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. In verse 14, So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. As we've previously noted, Satan cannot take the life of a believer. That is purely in God's precinct. Here, Satan moved David and the rest was over to David. The result depended on him and the Lord's response to his sin. As we can see, the result can be devastating. 70,000 people died. Why? Because David was not putting his trust in the Lord, but the trust in those who could serve in his army, hence the numbering of the people. Now, we need to avoid the devourer. So I want to talk for a little bit about our avoiding the devourer. You see, the Lord has promised to rebuke the devourer for us. This hinders him consuming those things that belong to us. God is prepared to do his part if we do our part. Whilst the battle is God's, we do have a part to play in this. Let's go back to Malachi chapter 3. In verses 8 to 10 it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now in all this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be no room enough to receive it. From what we see in this verse, God has an answer to the needs of man and they revolve around his ability to provide for every need that we have. God's part in rebuking the devourer in our life is that we honour the debt that we have to him. What he is saying here is that unless we acknowledge the debt and respond to that debt by paying what is owed, then the devourer is not held at bay in our lives. Some may dispute the fact that this is a debt. However, a close, close reading of Matthew 23, verse 23, and Hebrews chapter 7, 1 to 9, will clarify the issue for you. To me, this is, can be scary stuff. It shows that God is concerned that we acknowledge the ownership of the things that we possess. In other words, what we have isn't ours, it's his. Not to give him his portion, his portion is to rob him. You see, everything in the earth belongs to the Lord. What we have is not ours. You know, we, li we live, we die, we leave this planet, and what we 
have attained in life is left here. It's left behind. This principle is also acknowledged elsewhere in Scripture. Let's look at this whole idea of devouring as it is preserved in the nature of the Old Testament text. In Leviticus chapter 27, verses 28 to 29, Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. But it's Leviticus chapter 27 deals with vows, offerings, dedications made to God. We see that God has certain requirements on these things that are designated for him. We note, for instance, that if a man wanted to redeem anything dedicated to God, that he had to add 20% of its value as a redemption price to it. There is something else that we need to note from the above scriptures and that is that the devoted offerings belong to the Lord totally and irrevocably. The Hebrew word to describe the devoted thing is the word kerem. Kerem literally means that which is set aside to be destroyed. Our offerings are for God's use, dedicated to Him. They are not to be stored up, but devoted for use. Hence the idea of destruction and this involves the tithe. In an agrarian and pastoral society of Bible days what was offered was either the fruit of the land or the animals. It could not be exchanged for lesser quality or another item. In Leviticus 27 31 to 32 and concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange, and if he exchanges it all, it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy, it shall not be redeemed. You see, the idea here is that what belongs to God is God's, and you can't hold on to it. If you try and substitute something else for what it is, then God, uh, that God says that the thing substituted than the original belong to God. So both then become devoted things to God. They are kerem. The divine principle by which all this works is as follows. God uses what is devoted to destruction, that is our tithes and our offerings, to rebuke the one that would destroy he rebukes the destroyer by that which is devoted to destruction. There is another principle at work here, that is God brings life from death. Christ died to give us life. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces grain. John 12 verse 24. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul writes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2 verse 20. Our giving tithes releases God to rebuke the devourer on our behalf. That means God fights for us. Now I'll just give a little explanation of what we were talking about there when it says that which passes under the rod. Um, in uh, the, the shepherding days of Israel, uh, what they would do is at the end of the season, they would, at the end of each season, uh, birthing season, what they would do is they'd gather all the sheep together and uh, they would be brought together and uh, then they would be passed singularly before the shepherd who would count off with a rod, like one to ten, and each tenth one would be put aside. And these uh, animals would come through randomly, one to ten, and the, each tenth one put aside. But if the tenth uh, one appeared particularly good to the shepherd, and he didn't want that to be offered to the Lord, 
and he put it back into the flock and took the next one that was following, the Lord counts the, the substituted one and the one that he maintained and kept that they were both devoted to destruction. So we're talking about 20% there, not 10%, aren't we? So we are to bring all the tithes, the scripture tells us, into the storehouse. And the storehouse is where we are all fed with spiritual food. God says that if we do this, there will be food in his house. In other words, God himself will provide for every need that we have. There is a principle in God that those who have much have a responsibility for those who have little. When I hear of missionaries who work in difficult places, lacking basic resources, I know one thing, and that is that the churches aren't tithing in their support of the missionary. The body is not fulfilled in, in God's given responsibility of meeting uh, the needs of the body very often. You know, the storehouse needs to tithe also. In this way, God meets the needs for others through everyone, and that is uh, part of that community of faith. So what about the added benefits to this principle? Not only does God promise to rebuke the devourer, but he goes a lot further to encourage us in this principle of giving. He says, in fact, commands us, prove me now in this, Malachi 3 verse 10. You want to prove God? Try it now, he says. He says that he'll give us such a blessing that we won't be able to contain it. You see, blessing always begins with sacrifice. It's giving back uh, to God what is his. If we hold on to it because it isn't ours, what we have will be destroyed because God's is mixed up with it. Remember, the whole idea of Kerem is that it is devoted to destruction. We need to lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven, the scripture says. And in Matthew six nineteen to 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The greatest thief of all is the devil. The devil and those who emulate him have no access whatever to that which we lay up in heaven. What we lay up is not subject to the results of the curse that the devil has brought upon us. It is incorruptible and an eternal in its results because it belongs to God. And because it is eternal, its results are without precedent and are beyond calculation as far as our finite little minds are concerned. A friend sent me a story about a little girl who was about laying up treasure in heaven. You know, we never know what God will do with what he gives us if we will just trust him and give it back. The story goes like this. A sobbing little girl stood near a small church from which she had been turned away because it was too crowded. I can't go to Sunday school, she sobbed to the pastor as he walked by. Seeing her shabby, unkempt appearance, the pastor guessed the reason, and taking her by the hand, took her inside and found a place for her in the Sunday school class. The child was so touched that she went to bed that night thinking of the children who have no place to worship Jesus. Some two years later, this child lay dead in one of the poor tenement buildings, and the parents called for the kind-hearted pastor who had befriended their daughter to handle the arrangements. As her poor little body was being moved, a worn and crumpled up purse was found, which seemed to have been rummaged from some trash dump. Inside was found 57 cents, and a note scribbled in childish writing which read, This is to help build the little church bigger 
so more children can go to Sunday school. For two years she had saved this offering of love. When the pastor tearfully read the note, he instantly knew what he must do. Carrying the note and the cracked red pocket book to the pulpit, he told the story of her unselfish love and devotion. He challenged his deacons to get busy and raise enough money for the larger building. But the story doesn't end there. A newspaper learned of the story and published it. It was read by a realtor who offered them a parcel of land worth many thousands of dollars. When told that the church could not afford to pay so much, he offered it for 57 cents. Church members made large donations. Cheques came in from far and wild. Within five years, the little girl's gift had increased to $250,000, a huge sum of money for that time. It was near the turn of the 20th century. Her unselfish love had paid a large dividend. If ever you're in the city of Philadelphia, look up Temple Baptist Church with a seating capacity of 3,300 and Temple University where hundreds of students are trained. Have a look too at the Good Samaritan Hospital and the Sunday School Building, which houses hundreds of Sunday School children, so that no child in the area has to be left outside. In one of the rooms of this building is a picture of the sweet face of a little girl whose 57 cents, so sacrificially saved, made such remarkable history. Alongside is a portrait of a kind pastor, Dr. Russell H. Conwell, author of the book, Acres of Diamonds. It's a true story which goes to show what God can do with the little that we save, the little that we give. And after all, one-tenth is a little in the great economy of God. Whilst everything we have belongs to God, all he has asked is that we trust him enough with our substance so we give him the tithe and so prove that his hand is not shortened when it comes to blessing. If we start with the minimum, we'll soon recognise just how much the devourer is being rebuked in our lives, and we will want to give more, for we will not only see the benefits, but feel the difference it makes to us in our relationship to him. So God bless you as we come to the end of this uh, series, and I trust that you've learned uh, a significant amount as to what you can do, not only in advancing the kingdom of God, but being a, a ministry of power to see people released, healed and delivered. So God bless you.